Made in New Orleans is underwritten by Art Plus Design Magazine, New Orleans Auction Galleries, and New Orleans Living Magazine. Hi folks, welcome to Made in New Orleans. Tonight we have with us sculptor David Borgerdine and Tracy Gilbert with Orange Gallery. But first, let's watch David work in his studio in the Irish Channel. I work in bronze, uh, silicon bronze sheet, hollow form construction, and I, I typically start my work with loose sketches, uh, usually very quick sketches, and typically move very rapidly into the model stage with my work uh, because a sketch will get the idea, but in, in, you got to see the three dimensions to really figure it out. Um, I made the mistake and we got caught working directly from a sketch to the final piece, and it can begin a nightmare if you haven't resolved the three dimensional issue. So I, I moved from sketch form to uh, chipboard models constructed out of uh, chipboard and, and, and uh, super glue. And basically I make the entire piece as I want it, as I see it, out of cardboard first. And once I'm happy with that, that's kind of the aha moment where it's the piece has been born and at that point then I just have to translate that into bronze. I, I come across challenges in my work and, and production of my work with the bronze uh, on a number of levels. There's the forming aspect of it, which is difficult. Uh, there's the welding aspect of it, which has got some level of difficulty. Uh, finishing, finishing is another big one. Uh, the main challenge is having the forms combine into, into each other uh, seamlessly without exposed welds. So on most of these pieces, all of the work, all of the pieces pin into each other in such a way that it's all hidden. It's a challenge to make it come together the way you want it, no matter what, and it's a matter, uh, challenge of, of having it stand up uh, and cantilever or balance itself on a structure, internal structure that we put in, whether it's stainless steel rod or, or, or whatnot. But that's the fun part, that's the joy one aspect of the joy of, of, of making sculpture that I, that I have. Bronze, even though it's very expensive, it's, it's a joy to work with. It, it's like butter and you, you can, to weld it, to grind it. Um, compared to other, all the other metals, um, it's so much easier and so much more forgiving, which allows me to then form it um, and, and make it do things I wanted it to do. I couldn't get the shapes to do what, what they're doing out of steel. Uh, it just wouldn't work. Um, and bronze is, is, is not really affected uh, terribly by heat, so it won't, doesn't want to warp as bad as, let's say, stainless, which is awful. I'm not studying bones or anatomy. Uh, I'm not looking at those shapes and then trying to even abstract from those. But I think subconsciously, it's, those forms are in my head and, and they're, they're coming out in the work because a lot of the work uh, has uh, bone-like qualities, you, should, you could say. I think the similarities between my, my forms and, and bones is, is that um, I'm looking for the ideal perfect shape. And I think just by nature of design, bones have the ideal shape for what they do. And so I'm striving to do that, to make shapes that are perfect in my mind. And that, and that's, that can be a connection there. It, 
it, it can be mysterious, it can be uh, awe-inspiring, where you, you're trying to figure out why this thing is standing up. I've always been interested in portion, you know, the, the combining large shapes and small shapes and different size shapes, and then trying to have that challenge of composing a piece um, using dissimilar shapes and, and a wide range of dissimilar shapes, um, you know, with the really big to the really skinny. And uh, there's a challenge in doing that because it's not easy to, to compose a piece and have balance uh, using those shapes. And, and, and maybe it's a challenge that, that, that invigorates me to do that. We're back and we have with us sculptor David Borgerding. David, glad to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, you're from Michigan, so tell me a little bit about how you grew up. I grew up in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, uh, high school, you know, undergraduate college, th the whole thing uh, there. Uh, three sisters. Um, and normal upbringing, I guess. <laughs> yeah. uh, I spent a lot of time with my father um, working in the shop. Uh, with him, learning a lot from him, keeping away from my three sisters. Right. Um, uh, so did you know then that you were going to take a course in art, or did you just kind of pick up the trade techniques then? I think what I did was, um, I think everything kind of evolved uh, as it went along. I, I learned a lot from my father just making things and, and had an interest in making things, whatever it might be, right. know, rubber band guns. Uh, you know, fixing cars or whatever, but I uh, had a, a definite interest in, um, in in the creative process and using my hands. So that kind of developed and uh, went into um, um, uh, high school art, right? And where it kind of took off, right? So when you're working with metal, is that kind of a pulling back from your your childhood of working in those shops and things? Is that how you discovered uh, metal to to sculpt? Yeah, yeah. I, my first paying job was uh, in a fabrication shop, um, and I mean, I'm, I was just you know, 14 maybe, and I started welding then, and and kind of got that bug then, and um, and it really never looked back. What was your total education in art? Did you go to school to be an artist, or or did is that what you set out to do? I went to uh, to Kendall College of Art and Design um, for uh, for painting. Um, I think in high school, my guidance counselor told me to be a, a pharmacist, but um, <laughs> I, I don't know if sculpture was an op or sculptor was an option on that uh, on that test. But um, uh, it was really the only thing that, that interested me. You know, right. I had uh, high school art, uh, painting. Um, started out painting in, in undergraduate at Kendall College of Art and Design in Grand Rapids, and uh, my second year there, uh, kind of moved over to sculpture. Okay. Well, let's bring it forward a little bit. And how did how did you arrive in New Orleans? I arrived in New Orleans via my wife Gogo. -Go. It's usually uh, a girl. <laughs> yeah, um, who I met in graduate school in Savannah, Georgia, at Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, I met her, and, and she she's from here originally. She's from Harahan, so um, I was finished up and had a studio in Savannah, but. Um, uh, Savannah's a small town and uh, really needed something a little more, so uh, when she in invited me to, to check out New Orleans, uh, she, had, she was homesick, so mm -hmm. um, we paid a visit and uh, that was it. Now know, she so. makes fantastic jewelry, right? She does uh, these wonderful cuff bracelets, sterling and uh, anodized aluminum cuff bracelets, and um, she has a lot of fun with that. We'll have to get her on the show sometime. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. I'm sure she, she'd love to be here. Was it easy for you to get acclimated to the art scene here? I think it was. I mean, it, New Orleans is very open. I mean, I, I, I got that feeling immediately. And, um, you know, the first studio I had was, you know, um, um, on Valence and Camp, this old, this old bakery. And I had just got the studio, I was making some things. I don't know what I was making, but, you know, I think it was Art Silverman came by and stopped. and. And I, that's when I first met him, and right. and um, 
you know, we started having coffee and whatnot. So very, very easy going and um, <clears throat> uh, very smooth. I, I was, it, was, um, it was an easy transition and um, uh, not so easy. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it's always tough to get into galleries and, and, right. to, and to kind of get yourself rolling. But, um, but in general, the, the community, it's a very supportive community, and that's, that's one thing I like about the city. Cool. Well, let's talk specifically about your work. Um, you do these fantastic uh, bronze sculptures, uh, but not cast bronze, welded bronze. Right. How do you start? Start, uh, the sculptures typically start, you know, I have a sketchbook which I use, and uh, I do a lot of loose sketching, and fr from loose sketches, you know, I, I come down to, to some final thoughts, and then uh, from that stage go into cardboard models. Right. Um, so I, all my work uh, uh, starts life as a cardboard model, a maquette, um, scale, uh, to scale, and um, from then, uh, you know, I, from there I, I work on, the, you know, the composition when I get everything fine-tuned and then basically take that cardboard model and transform that into bronze, you know, right. use, use, a, use the planes of the model of the cardboard as templates to cut out the bronze and forge and fabricate uh, and bend the, the bronze and, and to, into the final piece. All right. Let's let's talk about uh, your inspiration. Is um, do your concepts come from nature or is it just totally abstract? Nothing. Nothing concrete. I'm not looking at um, at, at particular things and in, 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 in drawing inspiration from that. I think it's a filtering process that 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 goes on in my head. Uh, of, of images of, of of forms and shapes and things I see in nature and. Um, and you know my previous piece, you know, I might find inspiration in a, a component of that where I mm -hmm. want to expand on that and into the next piece. You know, so I get excited about that. So your older work informs your new work. I think it builds on itself. Um, similar shapes kind of evolve, you know, and then filter out. You know, right. after I'm done with them, you know, different shapes um, find themselves in similar work. The first show I ever saw of your work, I kept being reminded of like uh, science fiction dinosaur bones. You know, it was like it had a it had a feel. Uh, it's very natural, but you know, really spectacular. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it, they the pieces. Um, a lot of the work uh, ha has bone-like qualities or or tree branch qualities. Um, I think by virtue of being organic, um, it just it happens. Kind of right? things just kind of go that way. Right. And, and I think we you know we talked before too. I, I think about you know how um, about um, Bones being, uh, you know, the ideal structure right. for the human body, or for for um, yeah, they're perfect for, for what they were for made perfect for. Perfect for what they're, and, and that's essentially, in an abstract way, what I'm trying to do right. is make the you know the perfect ideal pared down form. That type of work takes a lot of physical effort. Is that really part of the fun of it? It really is, and that's where um, creativity and 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 trying new things. Um, really comes into play, you know. It, it, it can get mundane if, if you're doing, if, if you're being too safe, if you're playing right. it safe. So I'm always trying to to put a shape together in a, in a particular way or, or s stretch it somehow, you know. And th that goes into proportions and scale and cantilevers. But um, so I try to challenge myself um, um, in the in the fabrication process. Okay, you you just recently had a show at Callan Contemporary. Uh, how did that work for you? We had a great show. Um, uh, sold out. Uh, I think there's one piece still um, on hold, but uh, it's sold out. And uh, you well, know, it's always there's good. not much you can say about <laughs> that. I mean, I'm very excited. Tell us about your studio. I mean, you you've got a great place over in the Irish Channel. Um, it's a, I walked in. It was the Airstream trailer at the top of it. I mean, <laughs> give people a little description of what you got going on there. I had a small studio and was looking for something bigger, and it was easier. It was cheaper, much cheaper to, to, to buy and build than it was to rent something uh, of the size I needed. So that's, uh, I was able to stop and, and think and build my dream shop, basically. Right. And I'm very fortunate for that. Um, it's got all the right toys. All the right toys. <laughs> uh, you know, the Airstream, um, that's my office, and that's kind of where the computer is and where, you know, uh, Command Central is. Right. That was the, uh, the working. Um, uh, trailer for when we were building building the shed, so everything just kind of worked out. Um, 
you know, we bought that off a movie set, um, somewhat um, in Harahan and whatnot. But um, it's, it's it's a great space. It's got the uh, everything I need. I'm still adding on, and I'm still f finding that I need more space. So right. Well, you always do. Yeah. Now you mentioned movies. Do you do any work for movies, or is that? I've done uh, I've done some props um, for for a number of movies. Um, I have friends in the in the in the prop department or uh, property masters um, uh, for different outfits. So I, I've been I've been able to to have fun with that, and and that's what it is. It's just you know fun make believe right. film. You know make a sword. You right. know make it look like this. I mean it's just fun stuff. Yeah. Um, it's just a little getaway for me gotcha. now and again. Now you, you, we know that you uh, show at Cal and Contemporary. Is that the best way for people to see what you do? Check out their website, or do you have something else? Uh -huh. I, I would, I would check out Cal and Contemporary. Uh, I have a website uh, as well, BorgettingSculpture.net, mm -hmm. um, uh, where you'll see uh, probably a, a similar, sa the same work or similar work. Uh, on my website, there's there's much older work for reference, um, but uh, either way will get me. Uh, Get someone to me. Um, I reference uh, Callan on my website, so um, uh, either one of those. Okay. Well, David, thank you so much for taking time to be with us tonight, and uh, I appreciate you coming into the studio and telling everybody about what you do. And and uh, uh, good luck to you. Thank you very much. Thanks yeah. for having me. It's been a blast. You're welcome. We're going to take a break, and we'll return in a moment with more Made in New Orleans. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. Find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And we're back and we're with Tracy Gilbert of Gallery Orange. Tracy, thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much for the invite. There's a, 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 a mantra behind your gallery name. Why don't you tell us a little oh, bit about how that came about? That's a long story. Um, I'm originally half British and half Dutch, and I wanted to bring something different to Royal Street um, that wasn't directly f French to start with, right. and um, somehow, actually, my boyfriend went to the, the car um, uh, to get to pick up some windscreen wi wiper, and the lady said, and was because we were racking our brains for a name, and I didn't especially want to call it after myself or some she-she French name. Right. I really wanted it to be something simple and fun. And unique and quirky, which is what is all behind, you know, the Dutch humor. And, and of course, I don't know if you know, but the football team, the Dutch, and the William of Orange, and that's whole, the whole connection between France, the UK, and Holland. So it just seemed perfect. Um, so, so my boyfriend was um, at the car wash picking up some windscreen wipers, and the lady behind the desk said, Hey, you need to get this stuff, it's orange. <laughs> and so that's how it was born. So it was a combination of the Dutch. The British, the French, the William of Orange, the simplicity of the name, actually, right. and to be quite honest, is a very easy color to market. Right. You give them an orange cocktail and uh, they and remember you forever. And it is a happy color, so it to is. speak. It is. It's yeah. a very energetic color. It's a healing color. It's, um, right. and, it's and, done us proud. And you have elements of the gallery that are painted orange and it helps bring people off the street. You're on Royal Street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's not a Dutch person that walked past the gallery that doesn't come in. Or, any, or anybody who's wearing orange comes in. Right. It's just been a very... Um, unique uh, marketing strategy, I guess, and cool. just fun, and people remember it. So, cool. well, tell us a little bit about how you got started in the gallery business. What oh, well, um, actually, when I look back, I've been selling art since I was 11 years old. Okay. <laughs> when I was at school, I was always um, artistic, and uh, I did. I made some sketches at, at when I was 10 or 11 or around Duran Duran, and I took them to school. And everybody wanted one, and, and so I thought, well, I'll just go and make a photocopy. And so I went to the school secretary and took some photocopies, maybe if they cost a penny, and, right. and I sold them for two pence. <laughs> so I didn't realize it until later. Um, uh, actually, later I went to art college, and even at school, when I was at art college, people would just want to buy my art. Right. And um, actually, I, became, I was like a struggling artist because I just didn't have that drive to get up every morning and, and do it. Right. So it's years later, I was always trying to find what am I supposed to do. I did project management in Holland for telecommunications. I was even I had a stint in catering when I first came to New Orleans. Um, but I was always looking for that passion of what is it that I'm supposed to be or do. 
and then I got a chance to uh, work in a, in a gallery on Royal Street and I just uh, through being in there within days I knew this was what I was meant to do right. this kind of envelops it everything matched. who I am and uh, and I would like to go and do this by myself cool. so that's cool. kind of how I got into it so so I yeah I went from being the artist to being on the other side I don't think I was meant to be an artist but I was meant to have gone through eight years of art college to uh, get an appreciation for it yeah just yeah. to know what it takes to be a real artist well what brought you from um, the UK to New Orleans uh, a, there was a man involved, of course. Uh, okay. um, I was, yes, I was with that was with Shell Oil, and uh, we got the opportunity to come to New Orleans, and I loved New Orleans, and it was something that would envelop both of our passions: me for food, art, and culture. Right. And you know, Euro New Orleans is so European. I never felt as if I left Europe. So right. it's been a fabulous, and it's been fabulous to experience. Um, you know, New Orleans after the storm. We were the, one of the first people to close on a house after the storm. Um, so it was just a very interesting time, and people always talk about the the New Orleans before the storm. And I said, well, I don't know any better. I think right. it's fabulous. It's, uh, it was uh, so. Quite so how long has Gallery Orange been on Royal Street? Um, just over two years. Just over two years. We we did, we did like a little experimental pop up for a couple of months, and then uh, it was summer. And I said, you know, you'd be crazy to open a gallery in the middle of summer. And somebody, I'm not going to mention any names, <laughs> but he said, you'd be crazy not to jump on that space right now. You need to go and open your gallery right now. Right. And so I did. And well, never looked back. You certainly have a really uh, fine stable of artists. They, they're very popular. It's a, it's yeah. a very unique look that you purvey. Um, and we've been re very lucky because we had one of your artists on the show uh, just recently, Aaron Reichert. Yes, he's fabulous. We're very lucky to have him in the city. Yes, he's one it was of the city's finest, I think. Yeah, yeah he's well, a great tell guy. Tell us a little bit about your other artist. Well, I have a mixture. Um, how it all started was um, actually a Dutch friend of mine, Goose Kemp, who I knew through Shell Oil and through The Hague. We kind of reconnected through Facebook. And he says, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm selling fine art on, on Royal Street. And he says, well, would you like to represent me? I said, well, you know, we sell Rembrandts. We're not going to sell your paintings. And it just kind of spiraled. I was trying to help him. And I said to him, um, you know, um, they're all, you know, they're all so funny. You should open your own gallery. And he says, well, you're the one who wanted a gallery. So, and then uh, I got together with uh, Goose Kemp and Sarah Ashley Longshaw. She's a local artist. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I needed a few more artists. And I did not certainly did not want to poach anybody else's artists within Louisiana or try and steal other galleries. So I just thought that would be really bad karma. So I went outside the box and went to Canyon Road in Santa Fe. And that's how I started collecting my artists. I, I begged them to let me represent them. I said, you don't know me from Adam, but please trust me. I know how to sell art. I would love to represent you. I think your work would fit in. So that's how, kind of how it spiraled, just, just because I, I just did not want to have the local Right. You know, steal them from other galleries. So I went to Santa Fe, and, and slowly I've just been getting connections, and then local people have been coming to me. But I, yeah, that's that's kind of how it started. I really started with nothing, not mm -hmm. even a business plan. Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, one of the artists that you represent, Gigi Mills. Uh, Gigi Mills, fabulous. Yeah, she was one of the artists that came yeah. from Santa Fe. Yeah, she was one of the artists that came from Santa Fe because one of her. Um, from another gallery from Vale, they were together, and Gigi Mills had always had a deep love for the South. Um, because of the tradition. Gigi Mills was a circus child and um, always loved tradition, the South French architecture, and you can see that in her work. Um, she loved she Southern reminds cooking. me of Milton Avery a she little. She does. Yeah. But she's been a tremen tremendous artist in the gallery from the second we had her. Because when I first saw her work, I said, well, we'll just give it a try. And she says, but I do sell. And we put three pieces of work on the, on the wall. And from then, she just attracted a whole different crowd. and she. She's right. well, fabulous. Very lucky to have her. You were telling me a story earlier about the painting that you nicknamed the Troublemaker. Oh yeah, we just had a, a two-man show. In fact, we're right in the middle of a two-man show for Gigi Mills and Carlos Lopez. He's also a local artist. They both paint a lot of gray, but when Gigi paints a little bit of red in her work, then they come. It's 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 a crazy thing. So we called this little little 
French piece which was inspired by our recent trip to Paris and to France. We called her the troublemaker because I said, if you put her in the in the gallery, nobody's go nobody's going to want anything else. She's a troublemaker. So once let's, it sells, so it, it sold in, within a few minutes, and I said, let's let's hide her in the box in the back, put her away. She's a troublemaker. Right. So that was that was quite funny, but yeah. Now, you recently picked up another artist that used to be on Magazine Street, uh, Jason Horton. Jason Horton. Yeah. He's also local. We are getting more and more local artists. Um, he's a fabulous painter too. He he hand builds his panels, and then makes a lot yeah diverse, but lots lots to do with nature and animals and birds. Well, the the work that you carry in the gallery, um, Gigi's paintings typically are small, um, and your other artists have very large yeah. paintings. But it seems to all uh, have a cohesive uh, uh, yeah, effect. Yeah, it, it does. It, when I look at the, who's you know, we've had some come and some go. They all do seem to have a big, very graphic um, statement, um, almost simple. A lot of my artists are self-taught, which is quite funny coming I'm from someone. I'm self-taught, so I, I, un I understand someone, and Yeah, I did 10 that. years of art college, but I think it's actually an advantage when they're not, you know, pushed into an academy of you can't do this, you can't do that. I always say it's, I didn't have to unlearn. Exactly, exactly. So they have this total looseness and naivety, which I, I really seem, seem naivety, to like. Naivety, I've been accused Sorry? of having that. I said naivety, I've been accused of having that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, your, um, your, your gallery is set up a little different from maybe what people would, would think of as a traditional gallery because a lot of galleries do month-long shows where it's just one artist up and then the next time they come in it's a different yeah. artist up. You tend to have your artist up pretty much all the time with some emphasis on. Um, yes. Is that just because of the nature of the French Quarter traffic? I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's the way we do it. Plus, I'm just a new business, so I'm basically throwing up everything on right. the wall and seeing what sticks. Well, and I then the artists that do sell, I can't take them off the wall. Right. Well, I think the artists you know. like being up, you know, 12 months oh, out of the year rather than one. Oh, they're always fighting my three walls. <laughs> and I don't have much storage in the back either, so it's just, it's, it's, it, I, I, I have my hats off to these, these galleries that do shows every month because yeah. you're just reinventing the wheel all the time. Well, you it know, sounds we have, like we things have, are revolving through your yeah, door pretty uh, quick. Yeah, we have we have lots of collectors and repeat offenders. We call them repeat offenders. Right. They're fabulous. We look after them. They look after us. We become like a family. We call them the the Go family, the G uh, or the G O addicts. We call them the addicts. And it's really nice because we have a lot of young collectors, mm -hmm. uh, people just starting out, and and so we try to help them with as much as we can with layaways or discounts or how can right. we make it work? But you have for a you. wide range of price points too that people yes. can come in. For example, G.G. Mills paintings are in the 1900 range. From, I, I, yeah, from, from there and, and, and then up. So it's affordable and collectible and investment quality fine art. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay. Yeah. We, okay. Well, and we have fun doing it. And, fun and, doing and, it. And, you know, it's just, it's just been a fabulous experience. Well, that's the main On thing. Royal Street, because you just never know who's going to walk well, tell through us, the door. Tell us how they can find you on Royal Street. What's your address? Um, 819 Royal Street, where um, one block up behind Jackson Square towards uh, Esplanade. And we always have a little round orange patio table and chairs set outside. Okay, and your website? www.gallery-orange.com. Okay, and then you have a big Facebook presence, right? We do have a big Facebook presence. We, we make a joke with, you know, we're selling fine art off the, off the Facebook walls, but, you know, that's the way people get up in the morning, they have their morning coffee, they're just relaxed, they're reading Facebook. We, we're posting and they're buying off Facebook, which that's, is that's amazing. That's pretty awesome, but that's awesome. But I love Facebook. Tracy, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks for inviting. We enjoyed it, we yes. hope to see you soon. Yes, thank you. We'll be right back with more Made in New Orleans. Hi, we're Ola High, and you're watching WLAE TV. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Join us next time on Made in New Orleans. Made in New Orleans is underwritten by Art Plus Design Magazine, New Orleans Auction Galleries, and New Orleans Living Magazine.